Welcome back, everyone, to S1E1, the show where each week we pick a different sitcom, watch just its first episode, and ignoring any other information we may have about future episodes rated on just that episode alone. This week we're going to be talking about Scrubs. Scrubs went 182 episodes over nine seasons, the first seven of which were on NBC, with the latter two being on ABC. And we're going to be talking about episode one today, My First Day, which originally aired October 2nd, 2001. So to get things started, I'm Jay Gags. With me as always, the guys, Gordo, Joe, Nick, and Ferg. What's going on, guys? Yo. hey yo, Hello. Did you stick a penny in there? All right. So Scrubs, obviously a more popular show, um, but for the sake of always checking, has anybody not seen Scrubs leading into the recording of this episode? Gordo, I'm looking at you. No, I've seen it. Okay, so we've all seen Scrubs. <laughs> is it me, or does this show seem like one of the first shows that people seem to have a DVD box set of? Yeah, including me. It was the first DVD box set I ever bought. Yeah. See? Perfect, yeah. It was like people had this, like the first season of Family Guy. Reno 911. Aqua That was a big one. Uh, the, the Chappelle Show ones were big. Yep. I feel like I've seen more Scrubs on DVD at people's houses than I've ever seen it like on TV. When you, when you look at like the years, you know, like the early 2000s, like this... Like I said, episode one started 2001. DVDs are like climbing at that point. That's like kind of the birth of like DVD home usage really kicking up a lot. And there was no streaming. Yeah. So that's probably why shows like this are more associated with like the box sets. I was surprised to see how old this show was. I didn't think it was 01 for some reason. I thought it was closer to uh, like 04 or 05. Well, it had a long run too. So like it went nine seasons. So you were watching it up until like 10 years ago, essentially. Yeah, I feel like I don't remember it ever being on, like, during high school or anything. Like, I don't remember watching it or anybody talking about it. I feel like I heard about it first after we graduated, which was in 2004. Yeah, I don't, um, uh, it's weird. I don't have a lot of, I, I always remember the show, but I don't have a lot of memories of Okay, so this ran a culture. lot closer to ER than I thought it did. I thought this was, like, a well after ER, but ER, was, I think, was still on the air and popular in 01. So it was an interesting move to make a comedy version of that. Have you ever seen the original ER that's a comedy? No, there's a no, show there from the 80s. Maybe we can do one as a, a weird bonus episode or something someday. But it was a sitcom that took place in a hospital called ER. And uh, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld. It doesn't have to be a bonus. It's just, it's what I we mean, do. yeah, it could just be an episode. <laughs> oh, I just meant like, I don't know if we could find the whole show anywhere. Oh, it's one uh, of those things you always hear about. The internet uh, you hear exists. about them, like the Seinfeld DVDs and stuff. But there was a time where I had no cable and no internet, and I just watched every episode of Seinfeld because it's all I had. I like the, borrowed the entire series, and then when I had finished them, I rewatched them with the commentary on. So I learned a lot about a bunch of weird stuff. I've never done that with anything. Watch the commentary. Not to get uh, too ahead with uh, actors and stuff, but to go back to like the remembering, uh, you know, like scrubs in its day like at that time frame when we're in high school i i think of zach braff who is you know the star of the show who we'll get more into him in a minute but i remember like garden state being hugely popular and like that was right around when we're in high school so and he was already known for scrubs when garden state came out so that would be like my remembrance it, unless i'm completely flubbing what year that movie came out no i think you're right i think that was his big thing but i i mean I've, that was like his big thing and it was like that like indie darling movie boom that was happening but i've never seen it before i feel like that was like there's like that and like the squid and the whale there was like a time where it was just like that style of movie seemed to come yeah. out and people would like get obsessed with them and i just checked garden state came out in 2004 so right when we graduated so yeah so it, it all kind of checks out the original roseanne stop Oh, I have no 95, idea. Five, maybe? Because Sarah Chalk came right off of that, didn't she? Oh, no, she was the No, she was already time. gone by then. She, she was the, the original one, Becky right. came back. Yeah. But this still would have been like five or six years later. And by the way, Rosanna's show we will absolutely get into eventually because it's a... Well, I don't want to get into how I feel about the show. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about that episode. So let's get started with Scrubs, all right? So see, first scene starts, uh, you just get an alarm going off. It says it's 6 a.m., that's when we first meet JD. Uh, to skip ahead, I'm not going to wait for them to announce the names of characters. We'll just say them as they come and, you know, we'll get through it. Uh, played by Zach Braff, who we just talked about. Also, you know, known later on for Garden State and a series of other things. But he's, uh, he's narrating over the scene. So he's the main character and he's the narrator of the episode. Tells us that he normally can't sleep. Uh, normally can sleep through anything, rather. And, um, but this night he had trouble sleeping and he was nervous because he was about to have his first day at work. I guess that's relatable, right? You guys get uh, those points where, you know, nerves prevent you from being, or excitement or any, any strong emotion prevent you from being able to just go to bed? 
course. Anytime I have to fly, I can't sleep at all the night before. I find anytime I need to fall asleep, if I'm like, oh, I only have three hours to sleep tonight, that's a sure, <laughs> for sure I'm yeah. not going to get any sleep. That, that's when you clock watch. Yeah, yeah. you always got to get, I don't have a clock in my bedroom because of that. Yeah, but now we have phones, which are big, bright clocks that we always have next to us, right? It's like, that was less <laughs> of an issue 15 years ago, but now it's like, I'm bored, yeah. let me stare at this giant, bright screen. It and is a really problem. not fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. That's where listen to a movie.com comes in. I couldn't sleep the other day. It was like three in the morning. I said, if that, if I was going to be a doctor the next day, then I think I would, it would be a little different than any job that we would have. Yeah, two shares. That's true, too. It's a pretty high stakes job. I imagine not being able to sleep before having to go to your first day as a doctor in a hospital. And we see him starting to get ready and uh, we see him kind of playing around with the shaving cream. First, like this kind of war paint and then um, Ferg's signature to bikini top. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, know, I was like, which we've who's going to go for it? Yeah, I think this is a, <laughs> now the third time we've mentioned Ferg's Varsity Blues moment. But Is uh, that pictured <laughs> anywhere? Did you ever, anybody get a picture no. of that? No. Damn, uh, that sucks. That would have that been like. Well, then we have to recreate it, Ferg. That would have like, been right around like, 2004. Guys. Maybe 2004-ish is when that happened. And, you know, we were using Razor phones. So, <laughs> so even if we had a picture, you wouldn't have had any idea what was going on in it. <laughs> what, it just looked like a slime monster. Uh, and also, well, just, now with the just, now with the uh, technology we have now, I really think it's time to recreate that for our. Uh, <laughs> our that, that's what's gonna be the picture on the Fergberg T-shirt. Yeah, or if, uh, if you guys, if you guys all write in, yeah, maybe we can get Ferg to uh, to recreate, and we'll put it on the Instagram, which is findable by the way at s one e one pod uh, and s one e one pod dot com. By the way, it's the links to all our social media and where you can find us. I'll leave an autograph for all you ladies out there. There you go. If, the, if there was ever an incentive, th- there you go. <laughs> and I wanted to note during the shaving scene that uh, it's also completely unnecessary that any of this is happening because he has not a shred of stubble on his face. He has the cleanest face. I don't think he's capable of growing facial hair, at least at this point in time of his life. I, I know when like they re-brought the show back, he had like, I know when I was supposed to talk about like the future, but he could not grow a beard for his life. And Zach Brath in general, he gets that like puby beard with like chunks. Like Joe. I can grow a full beard. I'm just teasing yeah. Joe, you. Joe used to have a Joe's had full beard. We've, we've all we've all. I also like my beard. voice cracked when I tried to admit how much how manly I was. <laughs> I, got I, got a a I got a beard. <laughs> no, I've seen fully bearded Joe. It's not great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, and then we just cut into him like in his full scrubs, and then eventually walking into the hospital that he now works at, and uh, that goes right into him walking in. And you get this like upbeat music. He's excited for his first day. And the second he walks in, it's sheer chaos. And I actually thought they did a good job with this because it was pretty realistic to how most like lower tier emergency rooms work, like outside of like big major hospitals, like the chaos and everything going on and feeling like congested and yeah. clustered. I, I thought that was actually really accurate. Do they mention it's a teaching hospital? I don't think they get into that specifically. So. In Not that yet. I think they, they get to that later. I would just say that, that explains why it's like such like low like tier of like so many people like it's just a normal emergency room. Yeah, could just be busy. Where is this located? Did they even? Say I was just it? about to ask the same. I don't think at any point, at least for me watching this episode. So I don't really if, if unless it was addressed here, don't even tell me. I don't think it was ever mentioned, I, and I didn't catch it. And I usually look for that stuff. Yeah, I didn't see it either. Well, if it's his first time ever working in a hospital. And it's 2001, and they're in New York. He's going to learn how to be a doctor real it's quick. It's not New York. In any event, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a mess in there. He says, but, but, you know, like, despite all his years of schooling, it's pretty clear to him now that he doesn't know Jack. And you know what? That's a lot of jobs, right? Like, I mean, granted, there's a more important job because with him, lives are on the line. But I think just about any job I've ever had, it doesn't matter what the orientation and training is like until you actually physically punch in and start working. You you, you got to no get thrown into the fire. Even mm-hmm. once you start yeah. going too, like a lot of it is faking it. Yeah, fake it till you make it. Yeah, but I mean, we've had a lot of jobs that didn't have the stakes, right? Like if you don't pump gas right that first time, somebody doesn't die of, you know, a brain right. aneurysm or whatever. <laughs> exactly. So it's a little yeah. different. Maybe the car will blow up. You don't know. Actually, I'd say out That's of all true. of us, Jay's job is probably the most life-threatening if he did something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm no doctor, but yeah, I, it's just all fallen. And that's more just because I have, like, a, a physical job more so, like, I interact with, with things where I'm not behind a, a screen as much. But actually, Ferg, too, you know, without getting into, like, all our, our personal lives, but, like, if Ferg missteps in his job, he deals with crisis situations and stuff like that. So probably actually more so. And you're always me. bummed out when you're not feeling well and a guy in a shaving cream bikini comes running up to <laughs> save you. You know it's not going to be a good rest of your Don't day. Don't worry, guys. Don't worry, that. I got this. <laughs> 
<laughs> with his backwards F on his chest. I was very drunk. This is kind of fun to watch in Scrubs, though, because for the past, what, almost two years now, everything you hear about a hospital is just, like, such a huge bummer. Like, it was kind of fun to be watching something that was like, look at all these people in this hospital, even though there's a lot of notes of seriousness in this. It's just people here having fun and making light of what's going on in a hospital, whereas, like, I don't think now you could really do that. Because we're, we're learning about them all fresh out of school, where I think a lot of other medical shows, they're a little older, or at least they portray as older characters, so this is a little bit more relatable to some other stuff that we've had. Yeah, no, I completely understand. Then Things do seem a little bit more relatable. Um, what I was going to say was, though, is that did anybody else, when this show first aired, did they think that this wasn't a comedy? Because I didn't think that this was a sitcom, the way that it was portrayed. Honestly, when this came out, we were f fucking, what, 13 or 14? I don't remember. I don't remember this show coming out. It would have been out. freshman year, I so actually, yeah, 14 I or thought, 15. I remembered it being a lot sillier, so I definitely knew it was a comedy. There's some heavy, there's some heavy episodes, but I don't know about them. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I can like separate remembering when it came out versus remembering what I've seen. I don't know. I just didn't I also think don't this know if was I a sitcom. It, I, if I even thought of it, there were so many shows that were on back then too. But like when you're 14 or 15, like every Friday, every night when it, when you were home from school, when you could be out, you were out. Like that's the worst time. That's true. In, like, yep. a, a kid's life to like try to get him to watch a show because you're like, oh, if I have to be out, if I can be home at 11 or whatever, I'm going to be out until 1101. Like, yeah, I'm not home. Yeah, we didn't have DVRs either. and stuff. So, I mean, unless you loved a show and like set a timer on your VCR, I mean, to date ourselves, like that was your only real opportunity to be able to watch something if you weren't home for it. I had TiVo. Was TiVo out? Yeah, oh, you had TiVo. Was TiVo was, was new right around when Brent, the show would have yeah. been coming out, right? Yeah, that would have been pretty, but it definitely was out at that point, though. But we were also just at a point where we were just getting the digital cable where you, like, you had the on-demand screen and everything, so yeah. everything was mm. kind of changing at that point. Uh, so I want to get into the intro, because I feel like this intro, even though we're watching it for the first time, becomes somewhat iconic. Uh, it's really short, and we're seeing all the main characters of the show, kind of the, the camera's interchanging, but it's the same camera motion, right? They're all going through the same steps. And it's just kind of flickering between each cast member doing the same motions. And they're basically just getting a file, put an x-ray up, which, uh, you know, when, if you guys watch our YouTube and Instagram clips later, you'll see the actual thing is behind Nick right now. But it's just a, an x-ray with the name of the show is what gets hung up. And um, there's a song, uh, Superman by Laszlo Bain. This was a pre-existing song, so it wasn't made for the show. I have no idea who Laszlo Bane was before or even after had I not looked it uh, up. He, he broke Batman's back. Oh. Mm, Batman. <laughs> Protector. <laughs> but uh, I think perfect song. It, it really fits. I mean, now, you know, all these years later, I can't imagine another song in its place. It's oh, very no catchy. Way. Yeah. Very catchy. Yeah. It's a real earworm. Yeah. And they, they managed to make it catchy in what? It's It's got to be a 10 second clip. Yeah, it's a really yeah. short intro and, and it's good. And it, good hook, it's really yeah. the sweet spot. I think they, they really nailed it with this intro. It's pretty perfect, in, in my opinion. I can't think of anything. It's up there with the, the Rembrandt song from Friends for like, if you hear it, it's in your yeah, head right. for days. And it's just funny that these are both kind of examples of songs that weren't created for the shows, but now you could never picture them without the shows. And in both cases, unfortunately for the artists, you don't really know anything else they did other than those songs. You just got to hope they made enough money off of it. And off the, again, like the DVD sales, right? Like you probably oh, make bet. so much less money if you're the person who writes a theme song for a show now than you did 1995, 2001, because you get the syndication yeah. deal. And then you get every DVD unit that was sold for Scrubs. That Laszlo guy is making some money. So hopefully he's just living in a mansion laughing about his one song. Yeah. And uh, I wonder how that works for streams, but. I was going to ask the same thing, like. Just quickly reading, uh, Zach Braff recommended the song when right as he got hired, and I guess the creator liked it and ran with it. That's it's kind of Is there anything big he move, can't right? do. Yeah, but that's just kind of like to just get signed on. Uh, you're usually just happy to be there when you're getting signed on to your first big role, and to have like even a suggestion like that that works out. You, you think he'd be almost afraid to even approach about such a major. It's kind of like with uh, John Krasinski and like the filming of the intro. You know. Yeah. Yeah, some of the opening shots for the uh, the office intro were shot by John Krasinski. For those of you who are unaware, I was unaware of that. Yeah, the the opening shot. We'll get into it eventually because we'll for sure do the yeah. office down the line. But Episode yeah, those, those opening shots, yeah, those first few for shots you see, seventy five episodes, Scranton. and we'll talk yeah. about it in depth. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be a while, but we'll I get there. We'll die. get there. Me too. 
<laughs> I mean, I hope we all plan. don't. First of all, I hope none of us die, but I hope the world's still here by the time we're yeah. 75 weeks from now. I don't know, a year and a half. Good luck, everybody. We'll Flaming see. ball of COVID is going to yeah. explode at one point. At the time of this recording, if you're hearing the show years later, first off, great. We made it. Uh, the world survived. And if you're aliens, uh, hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> and, this, and if this was the rep- if our show is a representation of what uh, this world was, I'm very sorry. But if you're listening in the past somehow, buckle the fuck up because it's about yeah. to get weird. <laughs> it's going to get dicey. Yeah. Enjoy going to a restaurant, you dickhead, because it's all going to be downhill from here. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, all right. So the new scene is we're, we're getting some narration and flashbacks. So we're seeing their orientation and also. At this point, we're also kind of seeing that this whole, we're going to get a lot of heavy narration throughout the show. Like, this is all kind of going through Zach Braff's, it's his journey, uh, JD's journey, rather. Because he's a narrator, you ever get the idea that maybe he's an unreliable narrator, and that's why everything's so goofy? Well, yeah, I mean, it shows that. Like, none of that, none of that's actually happening. Right, I, I don't well, even I want to get into that later. But... Yeah, we'll get into that with a couple other examples, but I think you have a good point there. Yeah, and... there was something that's been bugging me about this uh, series that we'll get into later once we meet the character. Okay. And uh, so we're getting, um, like I said, they're at their orientation, and we meet his best friend, Turk. Uh, they room together in college and then med school, and now they're both hired to the same hospital, so they're, you know... Very close friends at the very least, right? They've spent the last, you know, eight years or so living together and, and now they're going to get to work together. And Turk played by, um, man, I'm going to butcher his name. Cause Donald Faison. Faison. All right. Uh, Donald Faison, who I only really know other than this from being one of the boyfriends in Clueless. Same. I was going to say, does yep. anybody recognize him from anything else? I don't know him from anything his... else. Yeah, I looked up his IMDB and maybe we're just a bunch of virgins who can't even drive, but that's all I can think of him in. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, Clu- Clueless is the only thing I could really... Just... I've, since this, I've seen him pop up. I've seen him pop up in other stuff, like since Scrubs, but I couldn't tell you what it was. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, hey, it's Turk. Good enough run on yeah, this like, show. He's definitely so... working. You see him and you're like, oh, hey, cool. But yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't followed his career. I'm not a phase on head that hard. Right. I love Clueless. Isn't he also on the Clueless TV show too? Didn't he like actually carry over? Mm-hmm. Oh, did he? I don't know. Did he? I, I, I only have like I vague memories did. of that show. We should cover that show. I feel like I feel like we should do Clueless and the Weird Science TV show. We can do like a after WWF 11 a.m. programming on USA. All movie spinoff show month. Yeah, for sure. We can look into that. So, yeah. So they're having the conversation. And basically, yeah, JD is asking Turk in so many words if he's allowed to sing the N word in songs when he's alone in his car. And or I don't even know if he specified alone. He just wants to know in general if it's OK. Uh, he is told by Turk, absolutely Yeah, I think he always said if we're singing along together, didn't he? Like, if yeah, the two of them yeah. were hanging out singing along, would he be like, allowed like to Like, I have that? a pass. I'm with him. So I can say because I'm with him in the moment. I can say in full honesty, and, and I don't want to get too deep into this conversation because it could obviously get weird. I can say 100% I skip that even if I'm alone in my car because I feel that uncomfortable about it. I would not even sing it alone in my car. Yeah, I think you kind of... <laughs> You kind of have to get comfortable with not being comfortable with it, right? Because if there's right. songs that you like where, you know, you're just blurting that out, you got to get used to not doing that. <laughs> it's like not every yeah. song's meant to be sang along to. <laughs> like some of yeah, them, yeah. And that's fine. I've heard some people use Ninja in place. <laughs> I think Ninja's a big one. Yeah. But I still don't like that because I feel I like still you're still trying to make a surrogate to. for it's it. It's too close. It's, it's yeah, close yeah. enough that, that you're hoping yeah, you don't want it's, to slip. It's pass, it passes as the same word, which is not what my goal is. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I know. I'll just, yeah, I'll just do the self mute for, for a word or so. And that's, that's fine. <laughs> I luck out because I don't listen to any modern hip hop. I only listen to mainly aside from some early nineties gangster rap. It's usually the fat boys aren't dropping that word. A right. Lot, so you don't even have to worry about fat boys. <laughs> LL Cool J. Like, yeah. Like those guys aren't really throwing that down in between there. <laughs> I'll get it with some Coolio every once in a while, but right. Oh, yeah. Poor Coolio. Mid nineties is probably that turning point. But anyways, anyways. So yeah, orientation is basically just uh, a long uh, intro for them to learn to avoid being sued, right? That seems to be the only thing that's being very like specifically taught to them is just do not get sued. Ted's my favorite character. I like how it was like alcohol plus surgery equals no no. Is that what was written? Alcohol plus surgery. Yeah, it's very very simple instruction. Yeah, I couldn't imagine sitting through Does an orientation. Does he have orientation. a name or is he just lawyer? Ted. It's Ted. It's oh, Ted. Yeah, it's Ted. Yeah. Yeah. He died recently too, didn't he? No. Oh. Did he? oh. I know yeah, he's Christopher Lloyd's nephew. Oh, he's is he really? really? Is he? 
Yeah. I he's. Don't I don't know that. from anything else except he's got a couple episodes of Seinfeld. I don't know if anybody's a big Seinfeld fan. Seinfeld's oddly come up a bunch tonight, but he's the guy who becomes obsessed with Elaine and makes the mannequins that look like her. He makes her the bouquet out of the old TV oh, guy. Yeah, yeah. He also has a he has a, a beautiful singing voice, by the way. He's from Vermont. Yeah, he died back in April of 2020. Oh, well, bummer. fuck what you! I... <laughs> Shoot the messenger. <laughs> Ruin my day. Well, all right, know that one. Do anyone well, out? Do you have a? Do you have the actor's name? Uh, so yeah, can... it's uh, it's Sam Lloyd, and it is Christopher Lloyd's nephew. Oh, well, R.I.P. Sam, and to the entire Lloyd family. He's legitimately my favorite character on the show, too. So, and this Sucks. is also this is also when we're first meeting Doctor Bob Kelso, who is the chief of medicine at the hospital, and he's being very upbeat and telling all the all the young doctors. You know, that th- they're all family there. And he's so overly positive that there's definitely something that's telling me something's a little off to me, at least. I, and I don't know if this, this was my just early impression of him. But were you taking that as genuine or did you feel like there was something more to the character? And it's tough to separate from what you know about the show. But I was going to say that was my toughest part was I have seen this show. So I really couldn't separate what yeah. I knew from his I thought character. it was enough of a flag personally, but I guess it's tough to say. Yeah, I feel like you knew he was, obviously he wasn't going to be that much of a nice guy. I feel like you can't be, a, if you, unless you're a pediatrician, there's no way you're a doctor of his age who isn't like grizzled more than that. Right, right, right yeah. Yeah. And we cut to the next scene and JD and Turk were talking and this is where we meet Elliot for the first time, who we did bring up earlier, Sarah Chalk, who is the second Becky from Roseanne, which is Really, the, the, the main thing I knew her from before, and she's done a lot of stuff after, so she's actually had a pretty, probably one of the better careers of this whole cast. She was one of my first, um, like, ooh, I like girls, girl. Oh, no, it wasn't, wasn't Rue like... McClanahan? <laughs> <laughs> it was not, no. Also, oh. we, were, we were in high school What's when wrong the show you? came out. You didn't like girls before that? <laughs> no, <laughs> Maybe because from when she was on Roseanne. Oh, in from the Roseanne. Fucking... <laughs> okay. In 2001, Nick found the year his was I was 2001. Confused. I was confused, guys. 15 years old. <laughs> Don't crucify me for it. Jeez. Yeah. Man, we've talked about Rue McClanahan so much on this show. It's like, there was like an evil turning point. If you, if, for those of you who want to go back to our Mama's Family episode, please do. Yeah, that's when we first meet Elliot, and she's, you get immediately, JD is in love with her. It's, it, he doesn't know how to behave. He's stumbling on his words. But uh, this is also a moment that was kind of good for the show because she's asked, Turk asks her if she's um, surgical or medical. So that's when we find out that she's medical along with JD's character where Turk is surgical. So we're kind of establishing what their roles are in the hospital now. So low key, kind of an important part of the show right there. Yeah, because the surgical people are like beefcakes and and like, like the popular people and the medical, are like the nerds. Yeah, the surgical is just like the jocks, it seems like. Yeah, this is like an Animal House, Caddyshack sort of sort of thing. It's like the snobs versus the slobs, right? Like the medical. It's just people like a are... different interest, right? You're like they're all getting into medicine, and they all had to go through medical school, so it's obviously a grueling process, and you have to be a good student to get to where they are. But it's the ones who like the hands-on aspect of it versus the ones who like the scientific diagnostic part of it. This I was thinking about this when we were when I was watching it. Surgeon definitely does seem like the I don't want to say easier role, but um, because I think technically it's more difficult, but as far as the day to day goes, I think it is just easier as far as that kind of field I know goes. I know what you're saying because to be for, for medical you have to figure out what the problem is. As a surgeon, you get told what the problem is and you say, exactly, cut it yes. out. There's no troubleshooting well there shouldn't be, I guess. I guess there is a degree of it if something goes wrong, but as far as a surgeon goes, it's going to be like, okay, here's Bob, um, take out his appendix. Okay, took out his appendix, see you later. He doesn't even have to meet Bob or deal with what's wrong with Bob. He just has to try to fix it, right? To any of our surgeon listeners out there, I think your job is very, very hard. I, listen, both, both jobs are very difficult, but I'll say to think of the medical side and to kind of defend Nick's point, you ever go to like a doctor and you're trying to explain what's wrong with you and you're super uh, nervous about how you're describing your symptoms because you're afraid you're going to tell them, like, you're going to mislead them in, in what's wrong with you. It's like, I don't know if it's a throbby pain or a pulsating pain, because you think, like, whichever road you take them down, could, they, might, they might answer the question the wrong way. So I, that, that's always something I'm nervous. I don't know if that's just me being a you know. It always psychotic. ends the same way, though. Mr. Finger comes out. Oh, n- we go to different doctors. <laughs> so you go to a very huh? different doctor than me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, he operates outside of the hospital. 
Joe, show me on this doll where the doctor touched you. <laughs> Joe's like, you know how that always ends up when they make you go into the parking lot afterwards or into the alleyway. Show me on this Rue McClanahan corpse where I touched you. Ugh. You get a water cookie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that we know that Elliot and JD are both working in medical together, we, we get a scene where like they're kind of walking up. They're walking together and they're just talking and she talks about how every male in her family was a doctor and that's how she ended up with a boy's name. And she had also said she made a joke. Uh, I can't remember what the joke was, but she essentially made a joke that she had to make note was a joke. And then JD said, oh, I would have laughed if you had paused. And the it was meant to be an awkward exchange between them because he's still nervous around her, but. It was so uncomfortable, like the delivery by him. I don't know if this flagged to you guys, but like it was cringy to me when he when he delivered that. Can I also say, can I backtrack and just say when they first when she first introduces herself and I think it's Turk who goes E T go. Oh, he oh. does. He does make oh, he, uh, does. he, goes, don't he, do he makes an E T joke. Yeah, don't do he, that. he does the Ellie. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he does. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys remember? I don't remember what yeah. joke she made. She said some. She had said some something about. I can't remember. It, guy I don't had. remember a joke. To be honest, there was a joke and it wasn't funny. And it I wasn't forget funny. What it was? Yeah, I can't remember what it was. It was like a dad joke that like would have landed and you would have went, oh. Was that before the the before they raced? Yes. Right. It was right before that because she's she says to him. That was a joke, and he. And that's when he replies with, "Oh, I, I was going to laugh had you paused." Like she was, he was waiting for a pause so he could insert his laughter for her joke. But the delivery of it was so cringy and uncomfortable. It like it was like I felt awkward as it was happening. I feel like I'm usually the first one to pick up on terrible jokes, and I don't remember that at all. Yeah, I missed that one, I guess. And then um, this is when they're they're starting to walk up the stairs, and Fergie just alluded to them racing and. It the was, it was at first though, there. yeah, but right before that was the, she, she was talking and she just says like, oh, I know what you're thinking. And then it just cuts to her butt and him saying like the narration of your butt looks like two Pringles hugging. <laughs> two Pringles hugging. What does that even mean? I was like, again, I was like, that was so weird. Like I've heard so many terms talking about butts over the years and i've never you know it's funny i never, never heard thought that of, i never thought about what does it mean but i laughed anyway <laughs> yeah i, I think i got to I, I i started to try to analyze what he said and i'm like i just don't what way is the pringle facing it's like a it's an odd shape you get and, like, the curves two out. the two mr pringle looking at you yeah what if they're going the other way like that, that doesn't make any sense yeah it, it, it wasn't a great joke. <laughs> I think oh, that's kind of a too, too, though. But they said two Pringle cans, though. So, but they you know, curve get... up. They curve <laughs> up on the Pringles cans do not curve up. <laughs> Pringles cans are a Pringles tube. cans are tubes. Not the can. I'm saying the Pringles. He's talking. He didn't say two ca- Pringles. No, he did. He cans. said two Pringles cans. No, he didn't. Think he, no. Did. he said two two Pringles. Hugging Wait, Gordon, you put other. Pringles in cans in your bag? He didn't say c- Pringles. He didn't say tubes. He said Pringles because they're shaped. Yeah. I guess. Oh, look, look a butt. Yeah, those oh. look just like Pringles. I thought he said two Pringle cans. Oh, it makes sense now. <laughs> it still, it still doesn't. It, it. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, "What the hell is sexy about two Pringles tubes going up?" That's not a butt. I almost want to buy a can of Pringles just to like make the photo to show on like our Instagram how much this joke doesn't work uh, logistically. I've got but... one downstairs. Oh, so. it worked because I laughed. All right, <laughs> butts are funny no matter what. Tell me how you want to take the photo, Jay. I'll bring him back up next time we take a break. Yeah, we don't need to do well, we don't need to do it now because by the time this episode comes out, but at some point, Joe, if you could just when you're in your kitchen next, if you can get two pi- two of the Pringles from your cabinet and try to make it look like a butt as best you can, we'll try to pop that on the Instagram <laughs> this week. All right, but these pictures might be 18 plus. Okay. Butts are always fun. <laughs> next background is Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and, and, and one of the things I, I did want to mention about the um the narration, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the narration, the audio quality didn't sound good to me. And I don't understand why, but it sounded like very like he was in an open room and it, it was like... I think that was on purpose. I think because it's supposed to be the voice in his head. It's like an echo. Like, yeah. Like it's I, mean, I, thought, thought. I noticed it was like echoey. I'm like, why is it like that? It just doesn't... I don't know. That actually really makes sense, Bert, that it would be like that. Like All I can think of. That'd be the best explanation if it was deliberate, because I felt like there was no excuse for the audio to sound that way. <laughs> it, it was. It would just... Definitely, I took note of it for sure. 
yeah, this does eventually turn into a race, like Ferg said, because she's very competitive, and that's that's what we're learning about her. And it turns into this fantasy montage of them running, but now he's dressed up in like like he's gonna run a marathon, like or like on, in like like he's running track. And it the the I will say the part were they even play were they playing the chariots of fire music? Or do I just assume? No, they're playing cheap trick. Oh, were they? All right. So, yeah. so they're running in slow motion, and it's this fantasy in his head. And the one part that got me is when he grabs the coffee. Like if you were running a marathon, when they hand you a water, and you just dump it. He <laughs> just dumps the coffee all over himself. That I actually found really funny. It would have been funnier if it was hot coffee, but it was his fantasy, so that wouldn't happen. <laughs> And that was another thing. We talked before that it's through his perspective, but it's almost like this weird interpretation of how his brain perceives things, right? It's Because it, this isn't the only time. We'll get into it later. No, it's a very common thing on the show, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fantasy-like warped reality that happens throughout the episode. So we're really living through his mind. You know, it's not just that he's narrating. This is like in his head how we're perceiving everything. So next we meet uh, the resident doctor there, Jeffrey Stedman, and, and Jeffrey Stedman, and just so I'm clear, because I'm not 100% sure, I thought the young doctors were the residents. Is that not accurate? I think they're all residents. So, because he's like, I'm your resident No, I think doctor, he said Jeffrey he's Stedman. the attending. Yeah, oh. he's the attending. Okay. A- attending versus resident. Attending is like the big guy, and then they're all- right. Yeah, I don't know how that stuff works. Yeah, because I think the residency is sort of like your probationary period. Got it. Yeah, that's what you do after med school. Is your residency. So, which is what I assume they were in. That's, that's, all right. Well, in yeah. any event. Yeah, they're like so, right um, school. Yeah, and he, and he specifies, do not call me Jeff. And while he's talking, again, we get into JD's like morphed version of how things are going, right? So now he just starts saying, I'm a tool, I'm a tool, I'm a tool, like over and over again. Oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought you were, I thought you were talking about Dr. Cox. No, 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 no. That's, that's a bit later, yeah. actually. And yeah, I, I mean, how do you guys feel about now we kind of have back to back scenes where this happens, where it, it goes from real to kind of this fantasy? Are we getting a vibe for how this show is formatted at this point? Yeah, I liked it. I like it. Like, I, I like it. Yeah. But it's kind of like, um, you know how on like Family Guy, they'll be like, oh, and then like this the happened. Cutaways. They, they cutaways, cutaways. Yeah, yeah. they're cutaways. It's like you think a, that's bad. It's like a real life version of that almost. It is. Yeah. And John C. McGinley's just so funny. Like, what perfect casting. Who's that? The guy who played that doctor? John C. McGinley. No, it's just a different doctor. Yeah, John C. McGinley. Yeah. He's in, like, a million things. And Oh, no, we're, that's, that's, that's Dr. Dr. Cox. Cox. Oh, we haven't met Dr. Dr. Cox. We haven't met him yet. This is the oh, other resident Cox. doctor. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but before that, they're handed, like, their beepers, which they're being told will control their entire life. And I know, I know like, beepers lasted, like, a long time in the medical field more so than it did in like popular They're still used in the medical field, yeah. You can still get them. Yeah, they're still used to a degree. By drug dealers. Well, I I didn't know if in today's world, like, I knew they had a really long run, but now with like smartwatches and stuff, are they still using pagers? Is that- It's because there's there's it's so reliable. It's it's just a, like you can like um you can lose reception on your phone pretty easily if you're in the basement or something like that, and you might not get what was sent to you. You always get the page. I think is the point of them. Okay, and they're annoying, right? Like you can turn your phone on vibrate, but your beeper going beep 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 like you're gonna notice it. You're not gonna miss it. I can put my my beeper on vibrate back in the day. In 2001, when this episode came out, I was still on like the tail end of me physically carrying one with me. Like, yeah, it was, like, I had a beeper for a while. Just, just about done at that point. Yeah. Am I the only one who didn't have one? I had just gotten my yeah. phone by, at that point. At that point, I had the really cool one that told you sports scores on a really slow scroll. So it was like the coolest feature to like brag to your friends yeah. about. But like realistically, like it would take 10 minutes just to see all the baseball game scores at that point. I remember, so. Jay, me and you've had the, the GTE pages when they first came out. I had one of those too, yeah. It, was, it like <laughs> slid into the like the little holder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like a two piece. And then the holder goes in your clip, right? Like your belt clip. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember those. I never had one, but I remember you guys having them. Yeah. I don't know why. I'm, I, just I don't might think still. I... I'm like, I'm such a hoarder for like weird stuff like that. I bet if I really searched around, definitely still at my mom's somewhere. house. Yeah. I kind of want to just get one now. Let's all get why? beepers and just beep each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get it. Like, so when when one of you guys is busy playing a video game instead of coming to record, we can just start beeping the shit out of you to annoy no, you. No, you know what would happen is I would. Oh no, nine yeah. one one. It must exactly. be important. <laughs> I would throw it out the window the 50th time I got a 69420 page from Gordo. <laughs> well, now I'm sure you can text. You just get D's nuts over and over again. <laughs> Boobs. <laughs> <spelled out. laughs> Eights and O's. S8008. 
<laughs> All right. So now we're going to meet Nurse Carla, who's Judy Reyes, who I honestly don't recognize from. She was obviously a mainstay on the show, but I don't really know her from anything before this. I only know her from Miss. Me neither. Yeah. yeah. She kind of like born, I, I haven't after. seen her pop up on anything else. It's like usually like, it's like oh, hey, it's Carla, but no. Nah. And she's good in this. You think that maybe she just saved her money, right? Like, sometimes I just think that with people who are on a show for nine years, you're like, maybe they just saved their money and said, fuck it. Yeah. And we have a, we have like a scene with her, like, it's like another flashback scene where she's moving a patient and JD hits his head and falls. Just kind of, it's like a quick cutaway bit. Like, again, going back to like the cutaway. Yeah, she style she tells him to always look forward. He goes, why? And then he walks into the. Yeah, walks into like, like a lamp look, or something. <laughs> don't follow me or whatever. Yeah. And we're also meeting uh, Dr. Cox at this time, too, which that's John C. McGinley, who uh, you mentioned right, yeah, earlier. That's what I, I fucked that up. And I don't I know him from the show mainly, and I've seen him in a bunch of stuff post Scrubs. But were, were there big credits that he had before this that I, I just don't think of? He's in tons of stuff from when we were kids. Office Space is probably the biggest one. He was in Seven. Yep, yeah, he's in Seven. He's in, he's a, in Wild a Hogs. Before Where Are You movie. And he's he's a reoccurring character on Brooklyn Nine Nine too. He's in he's in all the like Chicago PD. He just bounces around and he'll do like he a big a lot job. Of movies and... too is like a heavy. Like he was a bad guy for years. Like he's in Surviving the Game with Ice T, where he's like a murderer trying to kill Ice T. He's in On Deadly Ground, the probably last good Steven Seagal movie, where he cuts off a guy's arm with a pipe wrench. Like he's like always was like the heavy villain. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he was like. Like Office Space gave him like a whole new career. It was like, oh, this he was one of the Bobs, right? Perfect. Yeah, he's one of the Bobs. He's yeah. also apparently um, the voice of the Atom in the Justice League animated. Oh, and yeah. So when we're first meeting him, uh, Doctor Cox, that is, he's asking JD to put an IV in a patient, but JD basically just panics under pressure. So Carla does it instead. And yeah, I don't know. From this moment, Doctor Cox to me is such an interesting character. He's a dick off the bat. But the way he delivers things and his sarcasm and quick wit and he has a unique way of speaking, like, I, re- I really yeah. liked him, like, right off the bat. What I got from him, too, is, like, he has just spent almost a lifetime dealing with new residents over and over and over again. And, like, so he's, he's just kind of around. around yeah, he's yeah. been around the block. Yeah. But, yeah, he's, like, he's kind of a dick, but he's pretty funny. And he was talking, he was talking about this patient. I was going to say, he also has a bit of, like, the heavy lies of the crown thing because, like, he wants to be able to be left alone and do what he wants, but he realizes if he doesn't step in that these people are just going to get murdered by these terrible doctors. Right. So he's stuck constantly <laughs> yeah. having to help them. Yeah. But the, there's one patient at that particular time that he accuses him of always trying to die while it's on his shift. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, and that's when JD thought that he was being a little insensitive, which set like a bad tone between the two of them because he like spoke up and said something to Dr. Cox. It was <laughs> big mistake. Is that the passed out guy that he yells Eisenhower was a sissy to? <laughs> exactly, yes. yeah. So just to show an example of how his subconscious is not working. And now because of this, JD is no longer allowed to even talk when Dr. Cox is in a room. So the next scene, uh, it's all the new doctors are kind of making their rounds with Dr. Kelso. And Elliot was a little late because she got puked on. That's what she said happened. Shows up in glasses, by the way. And I was a big fan of that. Just wanted to take <laughs> note of that. I thought of that. When it happened, I was like, this is a J move right here. It, it, l- listen, that's my thing. Put glasses on a pig. Up. Jay's all over it. I, well, <laughs> I wouldn't go that pig. far, but in, in <laughs> Sarah Chalk's case, it, it was... Uh, what about Rue McGlanahan? To be fair, she probably had to wear glasses most I sure, of the yeah, end I, of I'm sure she went straight into and trifocals she, by the end, but... She had cataracts when Joe fell in love with That her. way she could see three of me. It was perfect for everybody. <laughs> um, But anyways, yeah. Uh, glasses aside, um, she wasn't really 100% sure of the question she was asked by Dr. Kelso. So JD kind of like steps in and whispers the answer to her. And in return for that correct answer, kind of uses that as a position or leverage to ask her to dinner, which she does accept. And I guess it was like a logical, like right from the bat, right? You see that he has a thing for her and that's obviously going to be the chase for the show right is his pursuing of her like but he went right right for it early on in the episode which i was kind of surprised i thought they were going to hold for that they do they get into that dynamic very quickly yeah and they don't they don't like teeter on it like uh oh will they won't they will they won't they it's like very obvious that that's gonna happen which is fine i mean not every episode has to like go on a four season chase but yeah they they do get into it pretty quickly here this show has like a weird thing too where like i mean 
every workplace comedy or workplace show people i mean like in real life it happens right people date at their work it's yep. a constant thing or whatever but imagine a situation like this where you're such a high stress and your hours are crazy and it's probably hard to relate what you're doing to anybody who isn't also doing what you're doing especially with wacky hours like that yeah yeah i was gonna say it's mostly the position that you know you wouldn't how are you gonna you know relate to somebody who's not a doctor it's tough, and uh, most of us have been there at some point or another, but yeah. I know. I remember when I got out of med school. <laughs> Not med school in particular. We're talking about dating Hollywood within upstairs the workplace. upstairs medical school but, that Gordo went yeah. to. <laughs> but yeah, no, despite the fact that in most cases... In most cases, you should not shit where you eat, but um, it does it does happen. And but yeah, they get into it really quick. But yeah, again, with those weird weird hours, I can see how who else is really gonna understand? It's it's, it's like a weird um concept, not even a concept, but like the to be a doctor and like go, you know, a bad day being a doctor is like pretty bad. Uh, depending on what happened, and then to go home and have to deal with kind of like trivial crap must be really frustrating. Yeah, it must be good to have someone who kind of relates to your unique, what what understanding of like human yeah. life that you. Like, oh my with. god, I got a flat in the Starbucks parking lot today. It's like, well, I killed a guy by accident, so you know. I gave him yeah. the wrong I medicine. Killed a guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't care about the fucking sourdough. Mm, sourdough. So this cuts though her her <laughs> her accepting the date offer cuts into this weird scene where he's watching TV. He's watching like this like family sitcom and as it cuts to the actual show, him and Elliot are the parents of this child, uh, in like a like a very standard, like kind of late eighties family sitcom. And the child asks why daddy married mommy and he answers by telling his son, I gave her an answer during rounds and then she screwed my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then his son I like goes, this you sitcom the man. scrubs a lot, but I kind of wish we were doing an episode on that sitcom that inside show, the show. I yeah. feel like I would like that show way more. Yeah. And then um, in this fantasy, Elliot rips her shirt off. And now she's just in her bra and just like jumps on top of him and they start making out. And then she put her glasses on and then Jay, all the blood oh, went yeah. to his head and he passed out. Despite the, had yeah, she had no shirt episode. on, but I was still like, oh, why aren't your glasses on? You know? She didn't have enough wrinkles for Joe. I know it was a fantasy scene. <laughs> But I would have preferred if you held off on the first kiss. You know what I mean? It, I know it wasn't their actual first kiss, but I think you kind of yeah. spoil that, putting that right up front like that in this like little weird fantasy thing. Oh, I don't. I mean, that's a fantasy. Yeah, okay. I think it doesn't count in a fantasy. But yeah, like, I doesn't. think you always wait to see the two characters kiss for the first time, and it just spoils it in a way. I don't know. I don't think I don't count it as real. Yeah, I don't count it as real either. Yeah, I see I don't it know. as a as a figment of his imagination. Different opinions. I I personally would have preferred it, wait, but whatever. So now we have Doctor Cox wheeling this older woman into um a room. JD's in, and he's upset because JD paged him, just asking how much Tylenol to give to somebody. This is a great exchange too. He's like, open up their mouth, throw as much as you can in, and whatever fits is the right amount. Yeah, he's like, it's regular strength <laughs> Tylenol. Yeah. That's also, too, I think where he's, they're like, he's questioning why he has the gurney. And he's like, oh, yeah, if you push around a stiff, no one will bother you. I thought he said she was dead. Yeah, that's what, that's a, what stiff a stiff is. is. Yeah. yeah, stiff is a dead person. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and then at the end, she's not dead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not yeah, really she's dead. Like, she's I'm, like, not I'm not really dead. <laughs> I was going to say, is that a, a fantasy of him? Or is no, that, was that I, real? No, that's real. Well, I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's tough the way that this, the, the way the show is orchestrated with JD's mind kind of flipping. I guess it'd be tough to distinguish if something bizarre actually happens to wonder if it was real or not because of how much they go to it. But yeah, I assume this was real. It just shows that, like, he's, like, the, the veteran doctor, though. He knows all the little ways to get out of work. He's... He knows all the tricks, all the hiding spots, all the ways to do things. And while they're talking, J.D. mentions Dr. Kelso, and Dr. Cox is very quickly to respond by informing him that Kelso is the most evil person on the planet. It may even be Satan himself. And I went back to it earlier. He's so, at this point, you've only seen him a couple times, the most positive person you've ever seen. He's a grandpa. And yep. And your impression of Dr. Cox is that he's kind of a dick. So you're like, no, you're not. He, you're the bad guy. He's not the bad guy. You're the bad guy. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to come off as. What do you guys think in that moment when he's, when he's questioning Dr. Kelso's character? Are you just thinking he just doesn't get along with him because he's so nice? Yeah, I think at that point you're supposed to think maybe that those two just don't get along, right? right. Um, because you're right. You do get that dick vibe from Dr. Cox, but and you don't from them. So. 
Maybe there's just this weird thing that you don't know about between them, and that's why Dr. Cox hates him. But um, I feel like I trust Dr. Cox more, though, because it seems like he doesn't lie. He seems like he's on top of things, and he's like a straight arrow when it comes to like not bullshitting, right? So if he doesn't cheater. like him, I immediately I'm like, okay, something might be up with that guy. Yeah, no, you can tell, though, there's something sinister about Dr. Kelso. He's always calling everyone sport or sweetie, always smiling. You know, there's some evil there. Like. <laughs> can we bring back sport? Show us yeah, sport. we could. How about, hi, Skeeter? No. <laughs> what is it with the That 70s Show cast and a hospital? Because you have House, who had not only Foreman, but Eric Foreman was on House as the cast name, as the character name. Uh, you have Kelso in this one. You have, isn't there a show called Nurse Jackie? That's three out of five cast members that have all similar. I don't know. That's, I don't know. Just something that popped into my head just now. Yeah. In Chicago, there was fest. one recently in production called Dr. <laughs> Hyde, but they decided that was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I didn't, I never thought about that. It didn't click with me. I really liked in this conversation, we get into this dialogue with Dr. Cox where he starts talking about modern medicine and how it keeps people alive much longer than they should be past when they're actually like normal functioning humans. And now it's their job to help them, even though they realistically, if it wasn't for this medicine, would have naturally died at an appropriate time for your body and mind, which was like this throwaway, like quick witted thing he's saying. And I thought was maybe the most fascinating thing that has been said in maybe any episode that we've covered of any show so far. It's pretty because yeah, it's it's deep, true and sad. <laughs> You yeah, know, like, yeah. It, like I'm watching going, fuck, man, that, that was <laughs> like, you nailed it. Well, I mean, it's also too because of what, what preceded it was when JD was like, I expected my patients to not be so old, you know, like he's, he, he's kind of bringing that on himself that this is, this is the real world here. When realistically, like when you think about your hospital visits, I mean, unfortunately they, the frequency of them will increase as you get older. Like when you're young and indestructible, you know, like, like nothing short of breaking a limb, like, uh, you, you're not going to really go into a hospital very often. It's fascinating too, because I think in general, most people, I mean, at least I will say my, for myself, I don't know the rest of you, I do everything I can to not think about my mortality and the fragility oh, of us dancing it. around this place. You know what I mean? I just try not to think about it ever. No, that's my thing too, is I don't care about dying. Like dying is not an issue with me. How I'm dying is the problem I, with everybody. I don't think you care about being dead because you're dead. Who cares? Oh, I, right? I do. I want to live forever. Well, oh, I know. I'm going to tell you this one, yeah. But and I don't want to, you know, go out in a long, drawn out. I want to get hit by a fucking bus or something like that or, you know, just have a heart attack in my sleep. Uh, I think that's the best way to go. It's tricky and I don't want to get into a super depressing conversation. I want my brain put in a robot. I want to be hit like a Guinness truck uh, by a Guinness truck like Mrs. Doubtfire's husband. I want it to be supreme irony. I want you to get hit by a bread truck. <laughs> a cheese it a cheese it truck rolls over yeah. Yeah. sweet sweet that, no on the amazing. side of the cheese it truck it says try our new gluten free cheese it's <laughs> yeah oh <laughs> coming it was soon like the first the first <laughs> shipment yeah it's on its way <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is this is taking a, an awkwardly morbid turn so um <laughs> just like scrubs <laughs> yeah yeah scrub i mean and, yeah and i think we'll the conversation we'll accurate that. for the show it is for sure and there's a scene later on that we're going to get into that really encapsulates that but uh in the next scene we actually meet todd who's another surgeon He's the todd Tar yeah the todd and jd's a little jealous of him right because he sees that him and turk are getting close they work in surgical together they're you know so now he thinks he's being replaced they're moving on in this hospital they're in kind of different areas where, where they where they work and todd is potentially the replacement i feel like with to the character todd they were trying for something else and it just didn't work because i don't know i the i get the the character they were going for but i didn't get the vibe that they wanted i don't think I don't think he was a... He was a throwaway. He yeah. felt like a throwaway. Right. He me. feels like a throwaway, and that's me knowing more about the show. Yeah. But what do you think they, they were going for? Maybe a bigger role? They, maybe exactly. Would, they, I think yeah. they were going for a bigger role than the character Todd ended up getting. Maybe. I didn't, I didn't get that from it, because he was, he was only in two scenes of the pilot. Yeah, but like Carla wasn't in a ton either, but... But more well, substantial she was in scenes. More. Yeah. She was in more. She was in but more for sure. She had her big moment telling off Elliot. But the way that Todd was presented, he, he, he was not spotlighted enough for a character that should have had, if he was a significant character, he would have been in a more yeah, significant Yeah, maybe he would have had a little bit more in the role. pilot. 
but who knows? Maybe there were scenes that were in the original pilot that didn't make, and I don't know for sure, but who knows? But I want to get into this next scene because I can only imagine that Gordo and Nick loved it. This is when JD is in a crowded elevator with an old man who has a gas issue and he, he's being tested to find out if the gas is harmful to others. And the entire crowded elevator reacts very harshly to that. And I could just, I, I would assume that this was maybe your favorite parts of the, of the show. I mean, I'm here for the actual fart, not to talk about it. So, I mean, it didn't get me that good, but it was yeah, still, it was still entertaining. That. It was a tease for you guys. Yeah. I mean, if he had just at the end went like, (laughs) that that would have been better. Or if everybody was like, what's that smell? And they're like, well, we're going to take you to the only way that like a not an actual fart works, like fart mechanics here. It makes it funny as if there's already a smell. And if people are (laughs) reacting to the smell, like Joe, I know that you, you're, you're a, you're a fart connoisseur, just like me. Did no, you go to school much... for fart mechanics? Was that a correspondence class? Did you take a course from one <laughs> yes, of those commercials? Yes, yeah, you guys were in class next to each other. It was child goatsy and farts right next door to each other. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have nothing to do with child goatsy. I just report the news. Um, I do want to also point out that the interaction with the gassy old man was actually one of the first really good interactions JD has with a patient. It was kind of the first sign that like he's got this, like he could actually do this job. Yeah, when tested, he has an actual very good bedside manner. And soon after is our first time meeting the janitor, who I don't like skipping ahead, but just for the sake of things, does he ever get announced as anything other than the janitor? Do we so find here's out the thing, him? okay? This is what I wanted to talk about. There is a theory out there that the janitor is JD's Tyler Durden. And they and I've been wa- I kept watching Scrubs after this. That nobody else ever references, looks at, talks to the janitor. That's I don't not think true. The, I don't think the janitor's real. They all go to his wedding in an episode. Oh, I, I forgot that one. Well, that would be if they one. all went, that could have been <laughs> just like this weird fantasy of JD's. Could be. Interesting. And they all talk to him. Turk joins his air band. <laughs> well, we won't get too into further episodes anyways, but just to talk about him in this particular scene for episode one, uh, Neil Flynn plays him and... He was also um, later in, he starred as like the father in the show, The Middle, which was like, a, it yeah. lasted a bit, but it was like a, just a Malcolm in the Middle ripoff. And the names were even so close where it was just called The right. Middle, but it was like the yeah. same show. It was like, how do people not notice that they called it The Middle? It was like so close. It wasn't the wife on that from Everybody Loves Raymond? It was, like, it was like more white yeah. trash though. That was the thing about The Middle compared to Malcolm in the oh, Middle. Oh yeah, that's right. They were just I so close. Right. Show. Yeah, I thought that the mother from Malcolm in the Middle was in that too, and it was like no. another sh- no, no, wasn't he, she in something? Else I don't remember. I don't remember seeing it. No, but I'm Nick, sure was, we'll you watch said that it's the, the mother show. from Everybody Loves Raymond, right? I'm pretty sure it is, anyways. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And you know, for future reference, Malcolm in the Middle and The Middle probably both shows will eventually tackle on this show. So add that to the ever growing list. Another show I'd like to tackle that he was on too was, did anybody see the show Abby's? It only lasted for one season on NBC, maybe like two years ago. No. I can't remember the name of the actress. She's the girl who ends up being Aziz and Zari's girlfriend in Parks and Rec. Oh, I know She's who you're like talking the, about. Yeah. Oh, like the one towards like the end, like the one he like really yeah. like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I forget her name. She's really funny, but this whole show is that she like has a bar in her backyard and all of her neighbors are like her patrons and he's like one of the main cast members for it. It was on NBC. It was felt very much in the vein of like a Parks and Rec, The Office, the way it was shot. And it was really, really funny, but it got canceled for whatever reason. But I think it's all on Hulu. If you're looking for like a one day binge, it's like 10 episodes. It's really good. Well, let's add that one to the list too. What's that show called? The Abbey? Uh, Abbey's. Just Abbey's? Like, I think of her okay. bar would be like Abbey's. Got it. Uh, he's also the guy who gets shot by the one-armed man in The Fugitive, which is like my favorite credit of all time. He's the guy on the subway wow. train who's like, hey, you stop. And the one-armed man shoots him and that's it. That's his whole scene. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it, but there's there's an episode of Scrubs in the future where he's an he's an actor and he's in the movie The Fugitive, <laughs> or he's in oh some my god, movie. really? Yeah, yeah. I'm That's pretty sure. Amazing. It's All right, I gotta find that episode. So to get back into the scene, though. So we seeing the janitor and JD interact for the first time and kind of having just an odd interaction. What is he trying to fix? It is it just a the jam door. door? The door is jam. The door is the door, jam. The automatic, jam, the automatic door. Yeah. And he's JD says like, oh, maybe there's like a penny stuck in it. And now he's like, well, if I find a penny in it now, I'm going to know it was you. <laughs> so he's so matter of fact, just turns to him and goes, did you stick a penny in there? <laughs> I laughed for <laughs> yeah, like five yeah, straight yeah. minutes. At. <laughs> yeah. He goes, why a penny? Did you stick a penny in there? <laughs> 
That was the, I mean, I, I'm not going to give my hand on what I thought of this episode yet, but that's the hardest I laughed the entire time. That whole exchange I thought was in the all, part of it. In all fairness, why, why would he go to a penny? <laughs> yeah, no, it's like yeah. a it's like a discussion between a father and like a three year old. You know what I mean? Like, what did you? He's put like ratting himself, but he's yeah. trying to be helpful. You know, because he's trying to help him diagnose the problem that he created. So he's just trying to maybe it's a penny. You should check for that. For years, I've had an obsession with like not anymore. When I was younger, I had an obsession with uh, shredders, like paper shredders. So when I was like sixteen or whatever, and I worked at Staples, that's back when like all this stuff was like floor model out, so you could test it. Right. So you'd have like 15 different shredders and you'd have stacks of paper. So you could like try it out and make sure it cross cut or whatever the way you liked it. So what a game I used to play every once in a while is if you put a penny just right in the machines and then turned them on and just walked away, they would slowly wear down on the penny, but it would heat up all the copper. And it would basically destroy the shredders, but like 20 minutes later, you'd be across the store and all you could smell was burning metal. I did it a bunch of times and there were cameras everywhere and I, they must have just assumed it was like, you know, an eight-year-old doing it and not me. And then later on- Not an 18-year-old doing it. Right. And then later on, even older in my 20s at a job, I kept asking for them to get a shredder and they were like, there's no way. I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to break it. Like, I just want the shredder to be helpful in my job in shipping and receiving and get rid of all these documents. They finally did. And the first thing I did is I set it up and I put a Shaw's bag through it and I broke it. Right <laughs> <away>. <laughs> and got in a ton of trouble. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not one piece of paper ever went through that thing. Just a Shaw's bag. Just fucking destroyed it. I haven't thought about that in a while. Jesus. How... How old were you when that happened? Twenty two, maybe. So what? So pretty what did you? What did you think was going to happen when you put a Shaw's bag in a shredder? Shaw's. I mean, uh, I didn't think it supermarket. would jam Plastic it and break bag. it forever. I thought it would shred the bag and it'd be funny. How would it shred? Okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Looking back, I realized I was wrong. But on upside, you're... it turned out to be much funnier than I ever anticipated. Yeah, you're you're hovering dangerously close to thirty six, and you still don't completely understand why it was a bad idea, which is alarming. <laughs> but. And my wife won't allow me to get a shredder to this day. So. Oh, shocking. Shocking. Uh, so let's go to the next scene where they're all doing their rounds again. And JD's distracted by just being near Elliot, it, it looks like. He didn't hear the question that was asked by Dr. Kelso. So now he's looking to Elliot for help because he had helped her earlier. So he thought maybe this will throw him the answer. And she looks at him like very honestly. She's like, I don't know. And then that was a complete lie because then no sooner does she tell him that and he admits he doesn't know the answer to the, the question, she answers it herself. It's a real dick move. Yeah, it was super scummy. Super, super dick move. Like, and it made me like some it's weird like in that moment i was so mad at her for doing that like it's it's because you just it's so relatable like what a piece of shit thing to do See, that didn't bother me what made me hate her was the scene later with uh carla but we'll, we'll wait till we get there well yeah we'll get into that but i do like the cutaway that happened because it's, it's his deer in headlights that they flash you first when he's asked the question <laughs> And then after she answers the question correctly, the, you just see like this big 18 wheeler, like just, just <laughs> completely mutilate him, just runs him right over and like drags him. And I was, it was like, it wasn't bloody, but it was like more graphic than you would expect for like the quick cutaway, you know, cause it like, it was a realistic hit. It was like Looney Tunes style. There wasn't any blood, yeah. but he got flattened. Yeah, exactly. I immediately thought of Freddy got fingered when he's got the animal <laughs> got the eyes on him in the tractor trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had a movie podcast so we could do Freddy Got Fingered. So we talk about Freddy Got Fingered. quote that movie for an hour and a half straight. Oh, it's so good. If there's any movie podcasts out there that want to uh, that want to do any crossovers, you know, we'll send send you Joe. Joe, Good luck. Yeah, Yeah, we'll send you Joe, uh, and you guys can talk about Freddy Got Fingered. (laughs) Do a double bill episode with Freddy Got Fingered and uh, Flight (laughs) ninety three. My perfect movie night. So uh, the next scene we have JD and Turk together again, and. He needs to drain the uh, the fluid out of a woman's stomach. And I'm just curious, did any of you guys note who that woman was? I did not. That was did Dwight's not, no. Aunt Shirley. Oh, it was Dwight's oh. Aunt Shirley. That's right. Wow. The second she popped up, I'm like, I know that person. And I had a look. I, I knew it was her, but I still had to double check and see. And it, sure enough, it was like a Dwight's little kitchen Aunt Shirley. Witch. The yeah. one that died? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't. So know the guys are the guys are in her stomach just shooting schnapps out then. Yeah. Yes. 
again, um, JD can't bring himself to draining the, her stomach. And then Turk just takes the needle and just shoves it right in him. And this is kind of one of the first more serious moments in the dialogue, it, at least in the internal narration from JD. Because he talks about how he's really jealous that Turk was able to do that. And then he kind of hated him for it. And it really was like a complete mood shift. Like even all the darker things that have happened in the episode so far were all done in jest. But I just thought the way he delivered that and was very honest about how he felt really took a turn in that moment. Well, this is where, like like I said, when I first saw this show, I didn't know if it was a comedy or not. If it was it's depending on what part you, Yeah, depending on what part you walk in on on any episode, I guess it would it would deliver that way. Yeah, because this is this doesn't deliver as a sitcom at all. This delivers, you know, and that's what I think the the appeal of this show is too. But I, I'll get a, I'll get to that later. But that's a really interesting point, Gordo. Imagine walking in on this show because like a friend of yours or somebody was watching it. And that's the scene you saw and you watch it for like two seconds and you left to go get popcorn or a drink or whatever, go to the room. You'd never think they were watching a comedy and you'd never think right. to watch it again if you only liked comedies. Yeah, but they, yeah. See, they they tend to sandwich the serious stuff between two jokes, like very goofy jokes. So they don't give it that much time and be that. Because even then, heart, because like, like her stomach, when he when he sticks her, like she's like shooting out like, you know, like true, water, yeah. like, like, you know, so it was like it was funny. It was it was done in a funny way. And then they bring that really heavy line in the middle of it yeah is that also... funny jay is that funny well, kind of yeah do you, do you <laughs> was... think that that water spewing out of someone's stomach is funny i found it amusing in that moment yes i did i, I did. laughed so did just I. because all they did was cover it with something <laughs> yeah she goes what's wrong they go nothing yeah <laughs> yeah the asking also... what's wrong i also like that she obviously did this a lot she had her headphones and was like was headphones strange strange yeah than u- more than usual yeah see if that was me i'd be scared shitless well, yeah. She doesn't know. This is also JD and Turk talking again because JD's kind of like this whole episode been trying to talk to him about their living situation now that they've moved into this place. And um, this is the first time he gets to really talk to him. And Turk's kind of not on board with them living together, even though they've went through college and med school together. He thinks that maybe it's time that they branch out a little bit. So it kind of just tacked onto that heaviness of that narration from right before. And so now after that, we get JD's pager goes off and it's in like, and he's explaining to us that that basically means someone's like heart is failing it's like and the way this works is the first doctor to get there is the doctor who's in charge of what's going on and kind of dictates and ring leads the whole situation so you see jd running and you think he's trying to race to be the first one there to kind of be in charge but he beelines it into a closet where elliot is also hiding so at this point by the way like i thought i missed something because they're already in a fight him and elliot and there was no like like a start of the fight from when she like screwed him over with the question. So I thought I like because I was also at work. I thought I missed the scene because um, they didn't have them like, you know, going to blows or anything. And then when he goes in there, they're already fighting. Well, he's mad at her about the the throwing him under the bus thing. And I don't know if there's any dialogue between them in between that, but he's mad about that. No, there wasn't any dialogue between them. Yeah, as I said, I, I rewound all the way back and said, did, did I just miss a scene of, the, of them getting in the argument after? But it, it, just, it just wasn't there. I didn't think it was, it was as cut- serious as they brought it. I didn't think it was oh. as serious. Exactly. Right. That, that, I mean, either, I didn't think it was that serious either. And then He was hurt. It was a bit, he, really t- he just, you know, we'll get into it because they're going to talk about it in a minute. Um, But essentially it was a betrayal of trust. He just met someone. He took a liking to her, thought that they had uh rapport building and, you know, was about to take her out on a date and she completely backstabbed him. So like, I can see being super upset about that. But, but I want to get into the cutaway is while they both run into the closet, we see that Turk is one of the first people there and he goes <laughs> to shock the guy's heart. And as soon as he hits him with it, he just, the guy jumps up the and just screams. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like this long <laughs> scream. <laughs> And just it just scares the other two of them, uh, the Turk and the other doctor that are there, because it turns out that Turk that guy was just asleep. Back at him. It's so good. The, the patient wasn't flatlined. The yelling he back was just is asleep. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was asleep, and the and the monitor the, that he was hooked up to was just had a faulty wire. So this guy was in the middle of a nap and unnecessarily just got the shock to the heart. <laughs> In reality, that would stop his heart, but it was funny for a second. I was gonna say, would that would that kill you? Potentially, well, depending on what's wrong with you, if you have like a, if it's if you're there for your heart, there's a good chance that that would probably knock it out of rhythm. I think it depends on how charged it is, too. Yeah, getting electrocuted is not historically good for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> also, terrible form. They didn't put anything on his chest. Didn't remove the hair. Didn't anything. So it's, uh, just, nope, just quick. Yeah, quick paddles in. Those paddles would have lit his chest hair on fire, and this was a hairy man. 
Right. Yeah, that's also true. Well, that's why you usually have to put a shaving cream bikini down on them before you put the yeah. paddles so there's a lubrication. Unfortunately, I went to a different medical school, Joe. <laughs> so we cut back to JD and Elliot in this moment. Elliot basically says that you would have done the same thing to me if you weren't trying to sleep with me. So I guess she did. I mean, it, it doesn't justify what she did, but she also thinks that JD being nice to her was only really with, you know, ulterior motive, which I guess does check a I mean, little bit where, because he did, because as soon as he helped her, he leveraged that to get a date from her right after. So I, not completely out of the doghouse, but I kind of get what she was saying there. Yeah, yeah, I think she's in the right there now. No, I was going to say, I imagine too, that if you're in med school as a, as a woman, like, you know, the ratio, I don't know what the ratios are, but I don't think it's 50-50. No, and she gets into that a little bit later too. Yeah, but you know, I mean, that's classic just defense, right? That and we think, and this is um the the end of that conversation is JD officially canceling the date between the two of them. What'd she say? Too bad I would have like screwed your brain. <laughs> so I think I that's late, a little late, a little later, right? It's definitely in the closet. Is it in that? Is it in that? It's scene? in that scene. I just don't remember exactly. No, what so she what says. she? No, because she said she was making an example of um. Oh well, you were only helping me because right, you wanted right, right. to screw me, and he goes, "No, I wasn't." She was like, "Oh yeah," and then like she put on this like sexy like, <laughs> "Oh, you want to screw me?" And he was like, "Yeah," and she goes, "See, I told you." Something like that. Exactly. Yeah, I can't it, it remember like the that. exact yeah. line, but yeah, yeah she calls his bluff on it. Yeah, yeah, but she was trying to goad him into basically admitting that he wanted to do the do the do the nasty. nasty. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like the next scene after all this is um, Doctor Turkin... Cox busting on them. No, oh, that's right. He does. Yeah, but no, it was so true. quick. He just walks in and he like yeah, doesn't even he get walks a fuck. in. Like he knows they're gonna be in there. He asked yeah. him for a catheter or something like that. Yeah, because I don't even think he assumed that they were hooking up. He assumed that they were hiding and trying to avoid being the one in charge that's the vibe i got like he's seen this enough times now but uh, after that we get two people who are actually hooking up and that's turk and carla which is kind of interesting because there was i think they had like one line of dialogue in exchange before this and now they're just already hooking up there wasn't really any build up to it they're just two young people at the hospital yeah, they don't give you the backstory to it yeah it just starts what i didn't but again, like, like you were saying earlier i feel like that's just a high pressure situation where people just probably yep. are hooking up so often Right. What I didn't like is that JD then goes and rats on him to Dr. Cox. Like, I get that you're upset that your friend doesn't want to move in with you, but you could have potentially just got him fired, right? And you're just being a little weasel. I didn't like that at all. And Dr. Cox in that moment. I completely missed that. Yeah. I completely missed that. He said it to him fast and (laughs) Dr. Cox says, I don't know what a Turk is. (laughs) (laughs) He just runs and he's like, yeah, Turk's hooking up in like the patient's room or whatever. Yeah. Dr. Cox does not care at all. At all. But I I did. I, I don't know. It's just like. I was really iffy on JD's character because like the way he kind of flips back and forth and he's kind of awkward at times, but I don't think he, I don't think he was tattling on him. I think he just knew a secret and he was excited and he's that childish kind of character. But you're telling you one of your like superiors in a way, right? Like he's, he's not his superior. He has his own like superior and surgical. Yes. That Dr. Jeff guy. The tool. That's so. I guess. Superior. I guess technically, I I didn't read that as him telling a secret. So much. maybe it was, but I read it as him ratting him out. You can look at it either way. I really don't yeah. know, to be honest. But I want to give JD the benefit of the doubt because that relationship, you know, right? I mean, yeah, I can't imagine that he get his friend fired on purpose, like that he's been with him for eight years or right. so now. Yep. And then from from there, we have this like the next scene is we see Carla and Elliot actually interacting for the first time. So the two main girls in the show, it's the first time that the two of them are actually conversing with one another. Elliot doesn't like how she's being treated at the hospital just and because so, he's a woman. somebody somebody calls or a nurse right 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 and she was like don't you see the stethoscope and the and the pager and everything and like i get it and we talked about this a little bit before she feels outnumbered in a predominantly male occupied position and doesn't like how she's being cheat uh treated what i didn't like was uh how it was responded to after that because she's confining in carla and telling her how she feels and carla's trying to be supportive yep that's that's the scene and that immediately made elliot yep yeah so she's being supportive and then elliot responds by going like oh well you know you wear a thong to work and you hooked up in one of the rooms like i don't know like why the did people you- talk <laughs> yeah, people talk and it's like, why why was that your response? You can find it in this girl. She's being supportive, being like, I know how you feel. And then she's like, Do you? Because like in Elliot's head, Carla is part of the problem why women are treated the way they're treated, right? 
by dressing, having a thong on that's noticeable or by hooking up with male coworkers at work. That's how men are perceiving the other women who work there. So I think that's why she's upset by Carla's actions. But I think in that moment, when you're confining in her and she's being supportive, who are you to then jump down her throat? I think it's also too delineating that Elliot's a doctor and Carla's a nurse. To, yeah, that she's a step above. Yeah, yeah, that like, you know, because that's that's a big thing in hospitals too. Nurses do most of the work and the doctors just come in and, and you know, that's how it's perceived. But not at this point. She's basically just an intern. No, she's not. She's a resident doctor. She still is Dr. Elliot. Yeah. She's but not... I just think in this moment, it's not even about, I don't, I don't even think that she was really looking at it as like, a, I'm of a higher level than you. It just seemed more oh, like- Oh, I did. You're, you, we are both women who work here and you should conduct yourself better because you are, you are why people talk to me the way they talk to me. It's because you act the way you act. Yeah, well, that's she how was I, using her position as a doctor to- scapegoat Carla. No, I, know, I, 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 I didn't I get that. that at all from it. From it. But I mean, it was possible. To that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we'll all read it differently. But uh, in response to that, Carla rips her a new asshole. She like just tears her down after that. That fiery Latina attitude she gives yeah. her. And she she explains it all. She's like, uh, I wear a thong because it makes my butt look good. And sometimes I like to feel nice about how I look because I'm yeah. here all the time. I'm either at work or I'm taking care of my mother. So, you know, and in regards to hooking up, that's the only opportunity I have to be intimate with anyone is when I'm at work because... Other than that, I'm at home helping my mother. And she basically, she, call, she calls her off uh, the thing with JD and she didn't help him. Yeah. And how word does get out. And, you know, ultimately, like what makes someone look worse? Is it, you know, being promiscuous at work or is it being disloyal to somebody? And yeah. And not helping day, out like, your doctor, not helping out your, your team, especially in a. Yeah. You're just not being there for your peers. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you can, you can make the claim that like if you're in business or you're in say, you know what I mean? Sure. You're pretty wants teamwork but like it's a different it's on a different level when you're a doctor because someone's gonna die if you if you have that type of attitude you know someone could very well die like it was an it was an interesting scene as a whole like just the yeah. way that all came off it again it, it got very very serious in that moment i think it was an important scene too because before that it, like you just were saying it's a competition to her when they should be a family exactly and she basically sets her straight and that is what really turned her character around right. from that point on from there, we get into JD's first on-call ship. This is when I think the show took... There was already serious moments like the one we just talked about. And this one I thought was like really, really noted to me. Like the show doesn't have a one set vibe. Because it, they try to make some comedy in there. But it's basically this like montage of him doing all different jobs and helping with different patients. He's still struggling to do kind of physical things with patients. Uh, he doesn't have time to sleep or eat. Uh, he even like steals a couple bites of food from one of the patients, which was like done for comedy in the middle of the scene, but it was all kind of done very seriously. And the way it was shot- If it wasn't for it was, that bite, this would feel more like ER than anything Right, else. that was the only yeah. bit of comedy in that right. whole thing. Because the way the music's being played, the way it's being shot, it has this weird close-up of his face. Like it's really, really serious. And it just completely turns the vibe for a second. I wish we had a doctor friend so we could see like how accurate like this was like right. was of the early days of being a doctor yeah uncalled. do we know any doctors it doesn't make sense that we would not our crew i mean <laughs> um but i mean did that uh, when you saw that was it did it take you out of what was going on it was so different than everything else we had seen at this point no because no because he was so worried because the whole episode is him being afraid to to do basic procedures that he's done on dead people the, the well, I understand, I understand that, but I'm saying just the way that this montage was shot with the, the even the music selection at the time, this was very reminiscent of what you would see on a Grey's Anatomy type of doctor show. Sure, the, the, but I the think whole that tone that, of it. But that's kind of what adds, and again, like I don't want to tip my hand, but that adds the dimension to the show that like it's not just a slapstick comedy set in a hospital. It has real elements, and I think that's what makes it work. Yeah, 100%. It made me feel like it was a movie, because this seems like the kind of thing that you put into a 90-minute movie and not a 22-minute oh, yeah. sitcom. You know what I mean? We're like, it's funny, and there's all these things, but now we're going to have a really serious thing. We'll bring the comedy back up in a little bit. It felt way more like some you threw into like the third act of a movie oh yeah this is like, like the one hour mark on a on a like standard like 90s teen dramedy 
like right yeah it seemed to not really fit in the i liked it i'm i like the way they did it but it seemed to be a different genre yeah that's a good way of looking at it joe and then to to go past that like i said we're, we're, the show's gone like it, it's this whole kind of series of events are all kind of serious right from the carla and elliot conversation to this montage into now where we find out that one of his patients crashed and died yeah, the old guy you see him with a few times in that episode yeah. and uh, the nurse needs to pronounce him dead and jd's still processing this. this is the first time he's lost a patient you know he's new here yeah the nurse needs him to pronounce him dead that the has nurse to, needs him to pronounce him dead and you can see how routine this is this just happens this is just death, yeah. part of working at the hospital right she's like can you just give me a time so i can go home like this guy is dead and she's you know it, we see this every day can we just can we just get on with the procedures here and he's still trying to process everything yeah, i think he says like i can't remember the like he says something very deep about how he was there and then he was like i wish it oh he says that he more, wants like... to help people not i think something like that it was something like it's like, my oh, fault i, I, I should have wrote writ stuff down yeah me too not. Yeah. But, yeah i forgot i feel bad that i forgot to write down what he said i remember the palmer embolism thing and i remember them having to do you know him calling it was a big deal but i don't remember what his monologue is that's really what like shined a light on him like he was like it's the same person that i saw and now he's dead it and from there, you know, he needs to, this is just kind of the life of the hospital. He has to move on and go right to the next patient, right? And you can't yep. really show your hand. Yep. You can't show your emotion that you just lost someone. You have to walk in and talk to your next patient. Like everything's fine and like your day's going great and you're going to keep their spirits up. Turk walks in and basically he's, he's trying to cheer him up. He heard what happened and he lets him know like, hey man, listen, like I know I've told you I don't get scared, but I get scared too. If we didn't have to wear surgical masks, everyone would see me like this. <laughs> for, the, <laughs> yeah. for those of you listening, it's a wide, wide open open yeah it's a wide open uh face yeah for those of you just listening via audio it's a wide open shocked face that that turk was <laughs> explaining with Turk was doing his impression of the scream mask <laughs> i forget i'm not just talking to you guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> And uh, also we find out that he did change his mind uh, about moving in with JD and he already took the keys from his bag. So they're going to, they're going to move in together. That was a shitty thing. That was shitty that he took the key or no, it was shitty that he just strung him along like that just because like, oh, he didn't, it didn't work out for him. So now he's going to move in with JD. I just thought it was well, a shitty thing. I don't know thing, if it yeah. was ever, I don't think it was decided that, yeah, I didn't perceive it that he, it wasn't his situation with Todd didn't work out. I just think he realized that maybe JD needs somebody with them. Like, during yeah, all this maybe. Season. Yeah. Still dealing with a lot. I, I was seeing it from the more cynical side of it, but uh, I guess that could be possible. And we get a little penny callback with the janitor during this. I can't remember exactly where it happens, but there's a point where the janitor is like just up. waving the penny, the penny at him. <laughs> He's just holding the penny up. Yep. I'm thinking about it now, and I'm that might have been oh, the end. So of, wasn't that the end of the episode though? It's near the end. It goes it's into near the there, end. but we're it's near when he's the walk, end of the walking out after his. Yeah, um, well, we're near the end of the episode, anyways. There's very little left, but from there we have a uh, JD has another interaction with Doctor Kelso, and this is this is kind of where we see the everything coming to reality. What we heard from Doctor Cox before, because this happened a couple times throughout the episode where um, Doctor Kelso is talking to JD about a recommendation for a transplant, and he just wants them to stay on like dialysis for a while and JD's keeps insisting no this person needs a transplant needs a transplant and then he finally just snaps he's like listen this patient doesn't have insurance and we're not doing anything if they have no insurance you know we're here to make money so right. without that we're just gonna we're just gonna do it the cheap way and then you find out why Dr. Cox is the way he is like right. Dr. Cox is cynical but he's ultimately there to get things done and to help where Dr. Kelso runs this as a business and it's all about bottom dollar well I think that's the the, the their positions too yeah, I like his, I like his line too when he says like he he carries a um clipboard around so he can have the illusion that he knows their names. Yeah, and he says if he's the villain, who's the hero? And that's when they cut the Doctor Cox. We we see Doctor Cox again, and you realize, yeah, again, despite his personality and how abrupt and harsh he is, you know, ultimately he's there to help patients. That's why he became a doctor. That's what he's there to do. And he actually guides JD and actually makes him finally get through his mental block. And he had to, you know, insert something into a patient. And he finally was able to do it on his own without having the nurse cover for him. And it was like a stressful situation where, like, they were going to lose the patient if he didn't get it done. So, again, a pretty serious for a comedy. Like, it wasn't yeah. like, a, this guy's got a boil. I want you to drain yeah, he it. Had to, he had to drain the blood from, from, he was internal bleeding. He had to drain it or something like that. Right, he was, like, right. like, relieving something, the chest yeah. pressure, maybe. Yeah, they had, like, throw, like, a wick in him or something. Not a wick. It was, it was like, a full-on tube to drain him out yeah and that's and that's it except for this last interaction that he has with elliot before leaving and she 
apologizes to him. I think the conversation she had with Carla really set in and she realized the error of what she had done or at least feels some sort of a remorse for it. Yeah, she did some task he didn't want to do for him too. I don't remember what it was though. Oh yeah, he like just I think it was like finish some paperwork maybe for the guy who had passed. Yeah, it was an, so no, it was just the she called the family. Oh yeah, and oh, asked right. for an autopsy. It was another serious. Con- it was serious turned into funny, but when that happened and she apologized, the the internal narration said, you know, he knew he could never forgive her for what she did, and then she kisses him on the cheek, and he's over it. It was like another heavy line, but then just they cut to the comedy right, right, right there. That was it, and then he leaves, and his that was his first day, my first day, as the episode is titled, and. One one hell of a day, right? And he walks right into the door, right? Oh, he does walk right into the door. That, yeah, as that he's was leaving, like the he's final, like, what a day, like bit. I did it. And then he smashes his face into the door. Right, right. So they give you one last button at least to be like, okay, Yeah, they give you a, a little bit of comedy on there, yeah. And he says, like, I, I made it out without looking stupid or something like that. Yeah, and the police, the police kind of look back at him. So that's it. That's that's the full episode. Uh, anything Scrubs related to this episode we didn't touch on or anything you want to bring up about any of the cast members or anything like that? I think uh, excellently casted and John C. McGinley is just perfect. I mean, this is one of those things where you're like, man, this guy can play anything. He was by far my favorite part of the show. His deliveries, the way he talks, the way he portrays that character was leaps and bounds. Easily my favorite part of the entire show. Although the janitor with the penny is a close second. I mean, that's right up there for me. The janitor is one of those characters who's like, he's awesome early because like you, you get him like every once in a while with like his crazy shit. And then by the end, they overuse him. And I, I couldn't stand it. It was one of those characters that just gets flanderized. We talked like, about this um like... like in prior episodes. The same thing with um who's um the character in Wings. I can't remember his name. Though, like the mechanic guy Lloyd 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 same type of thing right it less is more with, with characters that are a little weirder like that you you really gotta pick their spots yep so yeah let's just get to it guys let's uh decide scrubs green light or cancel Gordo I'm gonna start with you green light I like the show it definitely is a different style of comedy that we've seen um like I said I, I wasn't sure if it was when I first saw it whether it was a comedy or a drama but dramedy yeah dramedy um you know but it, it's a it's a good show it's it's different it has layers to it it is like a like a fine onion money many layers to peel classic can't can't say anything else about it green light a bad onion would also have many layers but it would stink that's true all right uh a good onion Nick. stinks too <laughs> this one Nick. this one was really tough um I found myself, because, um, you know, I try to judge it on how much I want to watch the next episode, and I found myself only wanting to watch the next episode because of what I know about the show, right? So I can't really use that as a good deciding factor for this because I'm cheating, if that's the case. I think by this episode alone, I think I would cancel it because there was plenty good. It was a lot of, I thought it was chaotic at points. Contrary to Jay's point, I thought Dr. Cox was a little too much sometimes. Um, a little too animated, and I didn't really like it. As I mean, like I said, I do end up loving it, but I think I'm going to cancel this show on the first episode alone, knowing very well that I do love this show as a whole. How could you cancel the show, Nick? Oh my God! Oh my oh, God, that Nick! Voice. <laughs> do you do you not do you not like uh, how do you not have any? Uh, what Whose you, voice culture? is that, Gordo? <laughs> Who are you trying it's to? It's all your amalgamation voice. of everybody's all your voice. voice. Who are you it's trying to? La- the last few weeks, Gordo's been <laughs> salivating. Go? I think I succinctly <laughs> explained why. You just like yeah. talk about how you didn't like farts and noises that they made. So like, <laughs> it's a little different. Gordo's been so dying for someone to cancel something, so he's yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, Ferg, on to you. Um, yeah, green light for me. Uh, Gordo hit it, uh, all my points that I would have said. Um, Shows um, an emotional roller coaster. It, it hits like highs and lows. Things I didn't like weren't enough for me to cancel it. Great cast, great actors. Hundred percent green light. Joe, on to you. Yeah, this one's a green light for me too. I didn't like. I said I saw the show in passing a bunch. I don't remember the seriousness of it, which I found pretty interesting. And sometimes I didn't think it necessarily worked, but I thought the comedy was 
a good enough balance and the comedy was funny enough and the characters were uh you know endearing enough and i did very much want to watch the second episode i'm really sure i'm going to start watching that this week so for me it's a green light by the way this was the hardest episode we've done so far of me forgetting about what i know you say that every episode but i mean (laughs) i will i will follow that up before we get into jay but i i'm almost on second uh season two of this one already I just kept right, going. So you kept going. Yeah. yeah. That's what I did with Country Comfort. Yeah. And uh, all right. So on to me. Actually, I'm with Nick on this one and I'm going to cancel this uh, in uh, for a couple a couple reasons. Number one, and I think it was kind of the most important thing to me in this episode alone, you know, and, and I'll say like Nick, I do like this show and, and I've watched a good chunk of it over the years. I didn't like Zach Braff playing JD. I didn't like his delivery a lot. I thought he came off annoying when I was supposed to sympathize for him and it just, he didn't click with me. And I kept thinking about how other people in that role would have made me like this whole episode more. Uh, additionally, the balance between the comedy and the serious is fine. I know that kind of becomes a staple of the show, but they were going through such extremes and I feel like they needed to be a little toned down because the comedy is so goofy and then the serious is Agreed. so they serious. They needed to middle a little better. Yeah, like they both needed to come down a step so that they could mesh it. And I just thought it just took you back and forth too often without like any warning. And it, it, it just... It was tough to follow it in that way. On top of that, you know, and it's different at times, but I found myself getting bored watching the episode at times. And and generally, I didn't think the episode was that bad, but I did pause it a couple times and like I was getting distracted and I couldn't focus on it. And uh, that doesn't happen with me very often in this episode. It did. And for those reasons, I got to cancel it. Um, and again, like Nick, I did like this show, you know, like outside of the, the pilot episode, but that's what we do here. We watch the pilot episode and we rate it just on that episode. That's what we do. That's why we are S1 E1. For well, the record, Gordo, I agree, do you with, I agree with you on uh, Zach Brath. I, 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 red light. my least favorite person on the show and he's the main character so <laughs> i mean i can't believe that you would do you no because you know what jay never no you know what joe to answer your question i don't have an opinion on jay because jay never gives me shit because you've canceled the canceling. same episodes that's why that's no a good reason no, no not, not always all not but always. one i think all but one no but but still jay never gives me shit jay's always been super neutral yeah. so i applaud your decision, Jay. Go fuck Jay. yourself, yeah. Gordon. How about what, uh, wait, what episode was it? What, what episode was it that we did recently? every episode ends with someone telling me to go fuck myself. <laughs> which, which episode was recent, though, that we that we did that Gordo canceled and shocked everybody? Was oh. it Shit's Creek? Shit's Creek, Shit's right? Creek. Go back. I don't know. I don't know what, what. By the way, I was very well behaved more. when you canceled Shit's Creek. I didn't say a damn word. Canceling Shit's Creek, I think, it hails in comparison to greenlighting the Big Show show. I think I just... That Another one surprised one me more than any cancel. You know what? Had. No, what, what the Big Show show is, he greenlit it for the reason he canceled the IT crowd. Right. So yeah. that, that's what it was for me. And for those of you who are just <laughs> catching us for the first time, the Big Show show, the IT crowd, Shits Creek, all episodes in our icon. Archives, so go and check those out. Well, anyways, to go back, uh, we have we've already rated. You're getting three out of five from us with the green light, sixty percent. That's still technically passing for Scrubs, but just barely making it in. So congratulations, Scrubs. You live on to see another day. Oh, I got through high school, baby, sixty percent. So uh, <laughs> that's it. That's all we have for. That's why none week. of us are doctors, right there, because that's how <laughs> right. we all got right. through high school. Two of us didn't so, finish. The other got 60% on the way through. So, anyways. <laughs> We're doing great, everybody. If you want to continue on, follow us on everything, go to s1e1pod.com. That's where you can find all the links to our social medias, where to listen to us. Everything's there, s1e1pod.com. So, that's it. That's all we have for this week. Tune in next week. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, Skeeters. Scrubs joke.